All right, in this lecture, we're going to review the topic of the Gaussian wave packet as a prerequisite subject for scattering theory. And this is because scattering theory can be analyzed in two ways. You can analyze it in the time-independent fashion, or, not surprisingly, we can do it in the time-dependent fashion. And as our review will go, we're going to actually conduct execute both of these in the standard quantum mechanical formalism. Normally, undergraduates get this version of scattering theory, the time-independent scattering theory. And there is a lot of value, I think, in doing the time the time dependent version, I think uh, it, it, it's actually, it's much, it's harder, but it's also more intuitive in the sense that you can actually kind of get your head around what's actually happening physically. So the, the standard example for a scattering problem in one dimension is, say, the one dimensional potential step. Or actually, let's, we might as well just not do something unrealistic. We'll just do the potential barrier, right? And in time-independent theory, uh, theory, you're using stationary states of the Hamiltonian, which out here are just sine waves, right? And inside the barrier are decaying exponentials, and then outside the barrier are sine waves again. And so you have this picture of sort of an incoming sine wave. Well, something's going on at the barrier, which is essentially tunneling. And then you have outgoing sine wave, but you also uh, uh, there's there's this notion of, of reflection as well. So this side of the barrier includes incidence and reflection. This side includes entirely transmission. And in here we've got something that's sort of uh, transmission, reflection, transmission, reflection. It's kind of the sum of all of that activity. But the point is, is this is. A stationary state so it doesn't change in time it is it, it's just this wave on both sides and inside the barrier and so this represents something that's happening for all time and in some sense that doesn't really reflect on the idea of some quantum mechanical particle headed this way interacting with a potential and then either being discovered over here discovered over here, or even discovered inside the barrier. So, uh, so, so the mathematics of this is definitely easier to get your head around, but at the same time, it doesn't really feel like it's going to capture the physics. So the time-dependent formalism solves that problem by saying, no, no, you don't have an incident sine wave. You have some sort of Gaussian or localized wave packet that is located way out here at high negative times and approaches the center of the system, which is often given as zero right there. And then it this, this uh, wave packet sort of interacts with this barrier and some of it bounces back and some of it penetrates and now you have two wave packets moving in two different directions. And then the probability is uh, it's still interpreted the same way, right? Right. This is the this portion of the wave function is the probability of finding it reflected, and this portion is the probability of finding it transmitted. And um, the wave function exists all in all of space. I'm just sort of showing the places where it's kind of so low that we just call it zero. And now the wave function is a function of time, right? So you need to know what time you're asking the question about. So. We don't usually study the uh, the time-dependent formalism, but I feel like we're going to in our attack on scattering theory. So, so in order to get us started, uh, we're going to review the nature and structure of the Gaussian wave packet. Okay, so let's begin. All right, so we are going to start. I've taken. I've written some notes out here, and. Uh, uh, I jumped in with the def definition that a book called Cohen Tanuji uses, which is one of my favorite books, although I have a lot of favorites now. The more I dig into these elementary subjects to do these reviews and to re you know, remind myself of the details, I go to many different books. And Cohen Tanuji is a book that I've always had on my shelf, and, and uh, it's never really been my go-to book, but it's becoming that more and more. It's just a really nice, thick <laughs> 
uh, full of uh, amazing detail, interesting insights. Every book is different, you know, and, and my library of quantum mechanics books is huge. I, I don't even know. I wonder if I counted them all, how many I had. I bet I don't. I have definitely more than 10. And uh, uh, I enjoy, I've loved going through them and I really see how the different authors define and start in different ways. But we're going to start with Cohen Tanuji. His little idiosyncrasy here is he starts with a time dependent wave function. And that's where this e to the minus omega t comes in. Some books will start with a time independent wave function or just set t equal to zero and then add time dependence later. Uh, but uh, And we, we probably will do a little bit of both. But this is just an example of what we're dealing with right now. We're going to talk about a wave packet. And here we have the wave function formalism. So let's make sure we walk the dog through the Dirac formalism here. And the Dirac formalism, would, would this is how we get from the Dirac formalism to this cohen tanuji expression. We start with an operator in Ket space that represents the state of the system, which is psi. And that state, we are now going to use the you can't overestimate its importance operator, the Yukozi operator. And we will uh, integrate over a complete set of momentum basis states, right, and acting on psi. So we know that this, right, is essentially equal to one, the unit, the, uh, the identity operator. And so this is a completely legal move. We're now integrating over all different um, wave vectors, momentum, which is defined down here. Notice I always end up writing all these expressions out. Otherwise, I just, look, I just, I just can't keep it all straight in my head. And there's no expectation. Uh, you know, while you're working it, you remember it. But then you have to come back and sort of remember, you know, just remind yourself little things like the wavelength h over p and k p over h things that should stick but sometimes don't and uh this expression here now right is still a ket expression because we have a ket on the left and a ket on the right but now we have introduced this character which is psi the inner product of the psi wave function with an eigenstate of momentum and this guy here is what ends up being g of k. So I just should, g of k and this guy, they are the same. That's where this g of k comes from. But we're not quite there yet because we have this plane wave state here, right? We have a plane wave state, this guy right here. Let's set t equal to zero for a moment. Already we're doing that. And where do we get that plane wave state? Well, that plane wave is the wave function of an eigenstate of the momentum operator in uh, the time-independent formalism, right? So we to get that, we multiply on both sides by x, right? And then this character right here, x, k, well, that is, when you solve the Schrodinger equation, e to the minus i k x over square root of 2 pi. So that accounts for the square root of 2 pi. That accounts for the e to the i k x. And so this is how you get from the Dirac formalism to the wave function formalism. And whenever you see a wave function formalism thing, I recommend you do this, right? Just to stay sharp on the Dirac formalism. And that's how QED is done. QED is done uh, in, a, in a really nice mix of all of these things. And then in the end, right, when we're all done with what we've just done, we add back the time dependence simply by multiplying by e to the minus ht, right? That's the conversion from the time independent to the time dependent uh, when you're dealing with stationary states. And we are, right? We're state These e to the i k x is those are stationary states. So the prescription is to take e to the minus h bar h, h t, Hamiltonian T, and get that back. And that's what this term is, is omega of K. That is prerequisite to the prerequisite, right? Understanding how to go from the time independent to the time dependent uh, expression for stationary states is elementary quantum mechanics. So that's something, if you've forgotten it, it's definitely worth reviewing. So with this in mind, we now have, we're now fully entrenched. We, we now sort of own the wave function expression here. And by owning it, I mean, 
we have gone back to the uh, the true formalism and de developed it right from the true formalism. And so that, to me, feels like ownership. So what is this basically telling us? This is telling us that our arbitrary wave function is the superposition of plane waves, right? And that superposition, uh, each plane wave is weighted by the factor gk. And gk is... Uh, uh, is uh, th this weighting factor is actually, turns out, is the wave function in the momentum representation. So now that we have established this formula, we're now going to apply it to the idea of a Gaussian wave packet <clears throat> and just walk the dog all the way through the entire formalism for the Gaussian wave packet. So we begin by asserting that our wave function is this Gaussian structure. Now, why can we do this? Well, first of all, assuming that n appropriately normalizes this function, which is completely normalizable, then um, this is certainly a member of the Hilbert space of possible states because it is a normalizable uh, wave function. And we know that this guy, although it's we don't have our time dependence in here, we know that there is some sort of decomposition where this actually equals some sort of integral over all possible momentum states of all these plane waves, right? e to the i p x, 1 over square root of 2 pi, right? Times some function that weights them, right? So we know that that's the case here. We're, we, we're, we're dealing with a situation where we have no bound states, everything is a free state, so we're dealing with this continuous integral over all possible momentum eigenstates, which we write as k, right? These are our momentum eigenstates. And uh, notice I'm now mixing the wave function formalism with the Dirac formalism, but the wave... And we are now weighting these plane waves. We know this can be done, right? So... So to get our time dependence, we just have to throw in the time dependence right here on the stationary wave functions, quote unquote wave functions, and those really are scare quotes wave functions because they're they're not legitimate physical states, as I like to emphasize over and over again. But uh, we so right in here, this is where the minus omega of k t goes, where omega of k is the energy eigenvalue associated with the wave vector k. Right, and in a f for the case of a free particle, we go back to this expression right here, and we we use this to uh, generate omega as a function of k. Right, so there we have it. Omega of k is given right right there by that expression. All right, so let me uh, go ahead and erase that. But we know that this is the case. So we can write this down. It is okay to write this down. We're, we're starting with a Gaussian, right? This is a Gaussian structure right here, e to the minus x squared over a squared. And the, if, if I were to write this Gaussian, the way this is written, if, if we uh, leave depart from zero to a distance a, we end up at one over e from the peak of the Gaussian. Now, that's one of the reasons I'm pointing that out is there's a lot of choices for how this denominator could look on a Gaussian. We'll go through some in a moment. But don't get too wrapped up on these differences. But every textbook has to make a choice. And we're just for this illustration, we're just choosing the most the simplest choice where A gives you the 1 over E width of the Gaussian. Okay, so with that in mind... Um, Notice what we've done here is we have actually systematically or sort of by telling the story of how to construct wave functions from stationary states, we've reconstructed the fact that our wave function, our arbitrary wave function, which we've assigned as a Gaussian, is the Fourier transform of some other function g of k, which of course is the momentum representation of the same Gaussian. And... I have prepared a little picture here, right, that our wave function is the Fourier transform of the momentum representation version, and the momentum representation of our wave function is the inverse Fourier transform of the spatial form. Now, this is, you, you can view this as sort of a coincidence due to the fact that plane waves 
are given as a f e to the i k x over one over two pi, right? That one over two pi, as I mentioned before, that's part of the plane wave definition. You know, that's how we normalize our plane waves, right? So, uh, uh, and when I I say that, what I mean is, what I mean is our definition of the plane waves is uh, given in this form, or do I have this backwards? Hold on. Yeah, 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 I, I have this backwards, I have this backwards. This is... Uh, uh. Oh no 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 that's that's right that's right. Regardless, this is uh, this is our our choice of normalization, and ultimately the purpose of that choice is is this uh, with this choice of wave function. When we do the normalization of two uh, different eigenstates of of uh, momentum. We're actually doing this construction where, again, we have used the Yokozi operator. For those of you who don't remember, in the early, in the early lectures, I called this the you can't, under, you can't overstate its importance operator, this, uh, which is what uh, the author Sakurai called, uh, uh, said. You can't overstate the importance of this ability to throw in a complete set of states integrated in this case because... Uh, X is a continuous uh, eigen, eigenvalue. But anyway, when you execute this and then you make these replacements for these two wave functions, and note, these are wave functions, right? The wave function uh, K prime and the wave function with respect to K. So we throw in our two plane wave states, which are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And the reason these two pi's come in is when we pull them out, we get one over two pi. And then we get this expression here, which is, and this whole thing is the definition of the delta function, k minus k prime. So that's why those two pi's are in there. And they also satisfy this idea that you get these Fourier transforms where uh, uh, phi is the Fourier transform of, of g, and g is the inverse Fourier transform of phi. By the way, you could have k0 in there if you wanted, right? You could have written g k zeros to have symmetry here. And in that case, you still would end up with the omega t, oops, no, minus omega t here, uh, when you go to the time-dependent uh, formalism. Okay, so uh, with that, um, we go back to this picture, and what we're going to say is, is that at time equals zero, we want the wave function to look exactly like this. So this literally is the amplitude, not the probability, but the amplitude for the probability of our wave function at t equals zero. Now we haven't added time dependence on this, so that is the next step. But, uh, but we, can, we can say that. We can say this is the probability amplitude, and if we broke it up into uh, components uh, of plane waves, then there is some weighting function which will make this connection a reality. Now, this is all in one to be understood in one dimension, right? So the particle is exists only along a line, right? And this image here, if at x equals zero, if we call this spot x equals zero on the wire, right, then this probability distribution reflects the fact that the particle uh, has some uh, likelihood of being, you know, a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right of x equals zero, with uh, most of its probability right there around x equals zero. Now, I'm, I'd like to do this without getting into the next dimension higher, right? I don't want to draw it like this, <clears throat> because now all of a sudden this axis becomes the amplitude axis. And there is this tendency to literally take these diagrams very literally for students, and you think, oh, you know, this there is this bumpy thing out there in the world, and it really isn't, right? Because it's it's all just probability of finding something in a certain one-dimensional position. Even this picture here, where I've kind of made it uh, red, I'm still punching into that extra dimension, right, by trying to make it thicker here than thinner. You know, uh, I... I I guess the real way to do it would be some sort of density thing, right, where the density of the lines reflects the extent of the probability, right? There's no real way around it. I mean, we're always going to fall back into this picture. But um, 
if this was a, a particle propagating at this one time, that would be the the likelihood of finding it at different places in the line. And and different potentials, by the way, would be like the material of this universe changes right here. And that would give you, say, a barrier potential that normally we would write in when we solve it, we write like, you know, some kind of potential barrier where now this access becomes uh, energy, right? And then everything sort of leaves this line and becomes these very abstract ideas. And it's always worth the while to sort of rejigger your head to understand what is the physical circumstance we're talking about. And when you do, you kind of get this sort of one line picture. Anyway, um, so, so you'll notice that the way we've set this up, this is a completely real value for psi of x, which is something we can assign it. We can say this is real. As long as you can break it down in this form, you're, you're okay. But what's important about this is if we took uh, a measurement of the momentum, right? If we, if we tried to, to calculate the expectation value of the momentum, we would find that the momentum of this particle is actually zero. Uh, so we could do that very quickly. We can see that, right, with this calculation, right? A, a calculation of the expectation of the momentum is uh, psi star momentum operator psi on dx. We replace our wave function, which is real, so psi star and psi are the same. You get e to the minus x squared over a squared. You take that derivative, you pull out a 2x i h bar, and I think there's a negative sign here, which uh, cancels the negative there. Not that it matters, because you end up with a constant times this guy here, but this is a symmetric function, and this is an anti-symmetric function, so this integral is zero. So the expectation value of the momentum for our uh, our, our wave function is zero as written. And um, which means that we don't have a particle that's, we don't have a little model of a particle that's actually moving, right? Some localized wave function that's actually moving using the picture I kind of didn't want to do, but you kind of have to. We only have one that's sitting still. So how do we make it so that this wave packet is moving? And this is just a universal trick that we, well, trick, universal fact that we need to uh, understand. So let's flush that out. Now, in order to flush this out, we have to understand what would, what would, ha what would be the implication of taking our wave function, multiplying it by e to the i k x. So psi goes to e to the i k x times psi of x. Now, the first thing we notice right away is that the modulus of this is zero, so it really isn't going to affect the probabilities of anything, because when you take complex conjugates, and you get this will cancel, so that's good. But what does this do to the overall wave function if we just multiply this spatial wave function that's all real by this complex piece? And we can, exam we can study that. So we're going to study this transformation, and what we're going to discover is that it basically takes your wave function and boosts it so that it is actually moving with uh, a, a wave vector k. And the way we are going to examine this is right here. We're going to take the expectation value of the momentum, which is i h bar times the negative minus i h bar times the momentum operator, which is right here, this partial by x, right? And we're going to uh, sandwich it between the wave function. This is the normal prescription for finding the expectation value for an observable, where an observable is always represented by a Hermitian operator. So with this in mind, um, uh, phi of x, we're now replacing it by e to the minus i k x of psi, right? So e to the minus i k x of psi is going to be our phi of x. So we make this replacement right here. So we have e to the minus ikx phi conjugate e to the ikx phi. So this is phi right here. That's phi, and this is phi conjugate from this original definition. And obviously, this conjugation of psi is irrelevant because psi is real. We've decided to find psi to be real. Um, for some reason, I dropped the I dropped the dependence on x here in this side, but it's dependent on x, right? 
So we're going to take the derivative of this whole thing here. And what do we get when we do that? We get uh, either the minus ikx psi conjugate. And then the then this, this, is, this is driven by the product rule because this is a function of x and psi is a function of x. So you get ik e to the ikx psi plus i e to the ikx partial derivative of psi dx, right? So this now is, is the uh, expectation value, right? This is all the expectation value of the momentum. And then the next line, you just kind of tighten things up a bit. And we, uh, the, the two e to the ikx is cancel. And you end up with this object. And you have ik psi and the partial derivative of psi. And then the, uh, the ik psi, when you complete this integral of this piece right here, right? IK is a constant, so it just comes out. So, and psi is normalized, so it's normalized to one. So you just get IK. The second part is this interval that, integral that remains, right? And that integral that remains is the uh, momentum of the psi wave function, not the phi wave function, but the psi wave function. So, the, so that psi, uh, psi wave function, let's say it's arbitrary. Right? In our case, we know that this integral was zero. But if it's arbitrary, then it's going to be some momentum zero. So the end, you end up with h bar k, which is a momentum, plus some initial momentum. Now, in our case, this initial momentum is zero. So you end up with a momentum of h bar k. So the point is, is that by executing this multiplication by e to the ikx, we have boosted our wave function to have a momentum expectation value of h bar k, right? So that is how we derive our wave function to be mathematically so. Uh, ma mathematically, our wave function is now uh, representing a moving Gaussian, a Gaussian that is marching along in this direction with momentum h bar k. And so we are now going to adjust our wave function so that we have an initial Gaussian like this with an initial momentum. And here it is, right? So this guy right here is our t equals zero time independent wave function. Well, it's not time independent, it's just sort of at t equals zero. But we haven't put the time dependence in explicitly. So uh, we have some normalization factor. Here's our initial, our initial Gaussian structure right here. And this is what gives us our initial momentum, or the, the momentum uh, of k0. We, we start it with k0. So that's our moving wave packet. Now, to deal with this normalization factor, that's really easy. We just normalize this whole thing. Now, to normalize these things, you have to understand these Gaussian integrals. Whoops, I've lost a dx in there. It should be a dx here. So knowing these Gaussian integrals, that's a prerequisite to the prerequisite understanding that we can integrate these things as long as there's over all of space. This is not meant to be an indefinite integral. This is meant to be, you know, from minus, uh, minus infinity to infinity. And that, for those who understand Gaussian integrals, it's sort of implied, right? So we know how to do that integral. And so we end up with this expression, n squared pi uh, a squared. And so for this particular form of the Gaussian, right? When the Gaussian's written in this form, the normalization is 1 over a fourth root of pi. Now, the reason I left n in this thing so, for so long is to point out the fact that this is a place that you can kind of get slowed down. You know, we, every book has a different way of expressing the Gaussian, totally legitimate, and the difference is, is, is how do they express the width of the Gaussian in uh, this denominator a, right? Everything that multiplies x squared, uh, how, did, how is it expressed? And here it's expressed as a squared, although look look at this lousy LaTeX, right? Uh, the 2 is touching that bar there. I, I could have cleaned that up, but the problem is, of course, you have a bunch of stuff in the exponent of e. So this is probably better, re better rendered in LaTeX as x minus x squared over a squared. I bet if I did that, the 2 wouldn't be touching that bar. But regardless, um, in fact, all these exponents to me are looking awfully big. But regardless, um, uh, 
n capturing what this normalization is in each different method is something that we should be familiar with. I actually, I think I did it. Yeah, here's some examples that I found in a few different textbooks, right? So sometimes they're, instead of a squared, it's over 4a, in which case the normalization looks like this, right? 1 over root 2 pi a. Um, sometimes they just have an a here, which is nice. You get the fourth root. It's sort of, I guess that's even simpler, uh, in some sense, but you, often you get 4a squared too uh, as well, so you get these normalizations. These normalizations show up all over the place. But we're going to start with the normalization from a different textbook, in case you care. It's, uh, it's Leboff's textbook. But this here, it's the very same thing. We're just swapping our, our width measurement. So instead of x squared over a squared, it's x over 4a squared. And then the normalization is this tricky thing, which is just the result of a Gaussian integral that you should become familiar with. And then here is our initial momentum, right? So this is a Gaussian wave packet with an initial momentum. It's fully normalized, and it is given by a characteristic length A. Now, in this case, what is A? Well, now, if you switch this to 4A squared, right, then when X equals uh, 4a squared, that's when you're at 1 over e, right? Uh, no, I'm sorry, when x equals, uh, shoot, when x equals 2a, right? Sorry. When x equals 2a, you're at 1 over e. So now, when, uh, okay, so when x equals 2a, you get 4a squared, that's minus 1. Yeah, so x equals 2a to give you the 1 over e position, okay? So that's just a convention that uh, is not totally uncommon. It's definitely the one that's being used here. So now, um, now we just, we're going to actually do this calculation, right, of this Fourier transform. And the calculation starts by taking our wave function, right? This is the expectation. This is this is the wave function we have. This is the Fourier transform we're after. And we're going to run the inverse Fourier transform, which is just taking our function, throwing it inside the integrand, taking e to the minus i k x and executing this integral, right? And with a little bit of simplification, we take this e to the i k x, merge it with this one. I think I got this backwards though, right? Shouldn't this be k0 minus k. Yeah, this should be k0 minus k, right? Um, yeah, yeah, so that should be k0 minus k, but now we have, you know, all the constants come out, and if we expand this exponent, we get the exponent. Now here I have used the <laughs> exponential form, and what you do is you have a coefficient in front of an x squared term and a coefficient in front of an x term, and now again, this is another Gaussian type integral that we have to know, right? So you know this Gaussian type integral. This is a little bit of a rabbit hole that you could go down. It's, if you haven't seen it in a while, it's worth reviewing, but this is sort of an elementary kind of integral that's expected. And it definitely shows up a lot in field theory too. So that's why we're kind of going through these is to remind you, get familiar with these exponential integrals. But in this case, this is a pretty good one to remember because uh, it kind of covers all your bases. Um, the one that it doesn't cover is, is multiplied by uh, a factor of x to the n, right? There's those integrals as well. But this one is pretty simple. And you end up with this term. You have this second term, the x coefficient, b squared over 4a. That's why I didn't catch my k minus k0 when I did it, because you square it, right? And so now you can flip it to k minus k0 instead of k0 minus k, because you're taking uh, b squared. So this coefficient is squared. And when you crunch it all, you end up with uh, this expression, and it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and you end up with g is this coefficient times another Gaussian, right? This is minus a squared over k minus k zero. Now, I'm pretty sure that this four here, right? See this four here in, in the denominator of this term, uh, that 4 is instrumental in the choice of the 4 up here, right? This 4a squared. Because of that 4, 
uh, you end up with a has a four in the denominator, but now you have a four in this integral, so that goes away. So your so your your momentum version, your g of k, has no four, right? So you live with the four in the space for in the uh, uh, you live with the four in this version, and you lose it uh, when you calculate this version. Anyway, but what is important is that the uh, this inverse Fourier transform of a Gaussian is still a Gaussian, which is sort of the point. So now you could, if you wanted to, you could rewrite this integral substituting in our value of gk, and uh, uh, you would have a full form of the wave function. So let's do that, right? Here is our expression for the wave function at t equals zero in terms of uh, its, uh, it's essentially its Fourier transform, but the way to think about it is its expansion in plane waves with its expansion function that weights each plane wave. Now we know what this expansion function is because we just calculated it. And we plug this expansion function right into, right, this whole thing goes right there. And you end up with this healthy expression for uh, our, our wave function at time equals zero or our time... Our, our snapshot of the wave function at time equals zero. It's a little bit of a, this is a little bit of a misnomer here because I'm basically saying phi of x and t with t equals zero. But over here, I haven't put in the time dependence, right? So what I really should be saying is uh, this is just the time independent version of things, right? Um, but we will add the time dependent in a second. So there's really no no reason to worry too much about it. But what's the next step here? We now, um, oh, I simplified the normalization a bit. And then, um, oh, and then I added the time dependence, right? So here's now the full time dependent version. And all we're doing when you add the time dependence, it's really just as simple. This is, you know, elementary quantum mechanics, right? The, the time dependent part is just, multiplying by e to the minus ht for the time independent solution, right? So this is the time independent plane wave. And the time dependent plane wave is just, you just add these time dependent oscillations. And clearly you can see that these wave fronts are going to move with this velocity um, uh, h bar k squared over 2m, right? That's sort of the energy eigenfunction. That's omega. That's what omega is. So I think we're going to probably simplify that in a moment. But now we, we take all this and we now we have the product of two exponentials. So we ought to make the obvious combination of, of putting them all together into one exponential. And then let's see, I think, um, right, so since this integral is over k, uh, there's a value in simplifying this term, this squared piece, to just u, where u is k minus k0, right? So we, we basically have u equals k minus k0. So k ends up being u plus k0, which is okay, because this happens in front of a linear term in x, so it's a little simpler to work with. And then this is just a, uh, this has no x dependence at all. This is dependent, this part is all, is, is where the t value of time comes in, but the integration is over du. Right, so du now being uh, a proxy for dk. And then you just keep crunching the integral, right? There's not much to do here. You kind of split this up into two parts. You add up all, so these are the linear parts. These are the quadratic parts in u. These are, this is a linear part in u. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. These are the quadratic parts in u. This is linear in u. This is uh, a function of x only, and this is well. I guess what we're we, we're not we, we're not really bundling everything. We're just blowing everything up, right? So we're just blowing everything because the integration's over u, right? So we've got to sort of organize things in terms of u. So we blow this up, we blow this up, we find a u term hidden in here, we find a u squared term and a linear term in u hidden in there, we find a constant term hidden in there and a constant term hidden in there. Uh, okay, so then we pull out all of the terms that have no u dependence because they're not part of the integral, and left behind is everything that is u dependent, and we have a u squared and a u part, 
and then we just go right back to the the same integral that we know how to execute because it's now u is going from minus infinity to infinity it's just d it's integrating over all momentum not all space right and when we complete that integral we get this monster right so we have this beautiful piece that is uh, uh, an exponential of a uh, of, of our k zero x this is our initial momenta and then we have this time de de time dependence it lands here some of the time dependence lands in the normalization and then this exponential is also has time dependence in that and so here you can kind of see this is where we have a velocity h bar k over m times time right that's that's sort of a velocity there well it is a velocity and then if you crunch it up, I don't know what the simplifications I did. I think I tried to mimic some other form. So I, I other form I found in some different book just to make sure it was, it was logical. I guess this is nice because it's all under one exponent to the one fourth there. It's not nice because you have complex thing in the denominator. So you could in principle uh, make it so that this is uh, split into a real and complex part. Uh, this is good as is, right? And uh, this exponential is a bit of a mess, but here we have split it into its real and complex part by multiplying by the complex conjugate of this uh, denominator. Anyway, so this final expression, right, this guy equals psi of x and t, right? That is your full wave function for this moving wave packet. And it's not simple. It seems like it should be simple, right? It seems like, look, we, we just chose a Gaussian in the beginning well, it is simple for one split second, right? And if you go back here and you set t equal to zero, that term goes away, that term goes away, uh, that goes away, that goes away, and that goes away. And it does, in fact, reduce to this really simple thing. The problem is, is when t is not equal to zero. And so the question is sort of what happens? And for that, uh, I've done the obligatory demonstration of how this works in Mathematica. So let me show you that. All right, so this is the obligatory demonstration of our wave packet. And uh, we put it all together. We've got our plane waves being added together in just the right way to produce uh, a wave function that at time equals zero uh, needs to have uh, this Gaussian shape. Now, the way I've depicted it here, I've started with uh, k0, the value of the initial uh, momentum k0 is set to 1 so why don't I just set that to 0 and you'll see you get this pure Gaussian shape I replaced the coefficient in front of the time here in this exponential part to be the group velocity vg that actual value is h bar k0 over m that's the group velocity of this wave and then this purely oscillatory part right is uh, uh, omega of t, but I indicated its functional dependence on k, right? Uh, in particular on, on, on uh, k0 here. So, and that's the result of our calculation, right? So now when we plot this, I have to plot the real and imaginary part and the absolute value. Now, when I do, do that at time equals zero, of course, all you see is the Gaussian. But as time moves on, whoops, it's not move on that much, you'll see that the Gaussian starts to spread, just as like we understand, the real and imaginary part actually takes some uh, uh, significant values, and they're out of phase with each other, just as you would expect. You see the drop in the peak of the wave function, that all comes from this normalization part, which is a function of time. So as time goes on, you're expecting the, the peak to drop because the magnitude of this denominator grows. Uh, you're expecting to see these oscillations start to show up and uh, you're expecting the width to grow because you have in this denominator of this exponential you have a time dependence for the width. So all of this is making perfect sense. Now uh, if uh, we go back to time equals zero but we add a unit of momentum say uh, one unit of momentum. The units, by the way, are h bar is set to one, um, mass is set to, let's see, I have 0 0.01 here, 
but uh, we could set the mass to equal one, right? And have nice convenient units, units for our demonstration. H bar set to one, we got the mass set to one or close to one. And uh, now what we see is we see, even though the wave pack is at time equals zero, you, you do see this oscillatory wave function contributing because there is motion, right? And for this to be motion, you're gonna see that uh, these real and imaginary parts actually are added up in a non-trivial way to get this Gaussian. And as time moves on now, we see that the center of the wave packet, in addition to the spreading, which we've already demonstrated, we see the center of the wave packet is moving. And it's moving with this group velocity, Vg. And uh, you'll see that the density of, uh, of the uh, oscillations is lesser in the trailing side and greater in the advancing side of, of the function. So this is really a beautiful little demonstration. It's really good to execute it and to program this yourself and uh, to sort of experience it. But the point here is we've created, uh, I won't say an arbitrary wave packet, we created a spe specifically a Gaussian one, which is nice and easy because we can do all the Fourier exponential integrals without much trouble. But there are other wave packets that are also easy to take the Fourier integral of. And this uh, beautiful thing is constructed out of plane waves. And that's important because the way we're going to study scattering theory is we study the scattering of plane waves, which since they solve the Schrodinger time independent equation, that's called time independent analysis of scattering theory. And we can also study scattering theory in the context of wave packets where uh, we assemble wave packets out of these plane waves. But if at a minimum you have to have a really good understanding that these arbitrary real-world wave packets can be constructed out of plane waves, and this helps with the with the learning objective of the time-independent theory, which is if you know how plane waves are scattered, you can always learn how wave packets that are constructed of plane waves can be scattered. So uh, let's move time a little more here, just for fun here, just so you see how this all goes, how it all grows up uh, as particle moves to the left and you can see as if we increase the mass the particle is slowed down it's got the same momentum but it is slowed down because the mass is larger if I increase the momentum you can start seeing that the oscillations grow which makes perfect sense right because that's uh, that's how this factor in here of the of the of the wave function starts contributing more oscillations so it's now moving faster, but of course, if I ch increase the mass, you know, I can always get it to slow back down. So uh, I, guess, I wonder, if, yeah, let's see, let's see how how degenerate we can make this. Really high oscillations, and if I really increase the mass, yeah, well, it's kind of fun, right? So this is really amazing. It's really a wonderful exercise to do. Okay, so we will continue our study of scattering with uh, some time independent scattering theory review uh, that will involve the scattering of plane waves. And then eventually we will move into time dependent scattering. It's going to be a lot of material, so it's going to take a long time. But uh, we're in no rush, so uh, I'll see you next time.